Become a sponsor today by visiting patreon.com backslash psychology is. When I was invited to give a TED Talk uh, in Scotland at TED Global, one of the big tent TED venues, I wanted to pick a case that I thought was important to me and might be interesting to other people. And the case I picked to talk about was a case involving a man named Steve Titus. Um, Titus was this you know, restaurant manager who was engaged to be married, um, you know, had a, a, a terrific life and suddenly found himself being accused of, of, of a rape uh, and then being convicted of a rape that he didn't do. Uh, and ultimately, even though he was convicted, it was a, a journalist, a newspaper reporter who, who essentially dug into this case and found the real person. So Titus was eventually uh, you know, free of having to go to prison, but he was so bitter, he, he lost his job, he lost his fiance, he, he was so bitter that he filed a lawsuit and, and just days before that lawsuit was to go to court where he could be compensated for all his suffering. He died of a, a stress-related heart attack and he was just 35 years old. Mm. So um, that tells you, uh, you know, it, it illustrates a lot of things, but um, one of them is just how stressful it can be for someone to be accused, convicted, of something they didn't do. And so was it the case that that the victim of this rape identified him as the perpetrator? Uh, she did. Yeah. So I mean she was a she was a genuine rape victim, but she and when she first looked at a, a, a photo spread, she was not all that confident. She said something like, "Well, that one's the closest" and pointed to uh, Steve Titus. But by the time she got to trial, her confidence level had been boosted and she was now highly confident in the trial and very persuasive to the, to the jury. Mm. One of the other cases that I learned about through, through your work was the case of the man named Ronald Cotton. And I've watched interviews with Ronald Cotton and the woman who had falsely identified him as her rapist. And some people may know that it's just an amazing story of, of many things, including misremembering, but also of forgiveness because Ronald Cotton was convicted of rape, did time in jail, and then was exonerated, fortunately, and forgave the woman who falsely identified him. And they wrote a book together called Picking Cotton, and they've gone on tour together and been interviewed together many times. And... What stuck with me was when she described her experience of that process and of falsely identifying him, she basically said that initially the memory of that assault was vague. The details of the man's face were vague. But when she had selected him from a lineup, she then had a face to place on that memory, to essentially superimpose on the memory. And so that then every next time that memory played out, it had Ronald Cotton's face there. And she was unable to distinguish that that was actually a figment of imagination, essentially superimposed into the memory. So this is, go ahead, please. No, no, that, uh, you've described things um, uh, pretty well. And, um, you know, I've had a lot of uh, op uh, opportunity to interact a few times with uh, Jennifer Thompson, the, the rape victim in that case, uh, a little less often with uh, Ronald Cotton, although I, I'm a Facebook friend of both of them. So I, I, every now and then I get to see what they're up to when they post something about themselves. But, you know, what is also remarkable about their story is that they, they turn this experience into um, the forgiveness that you talk about, but the also a friendship where their families were interacting with each other, the book they wrote together, Picking Cotton, and, and then their kind of crusade to be out there and try to advocate for reforms in the system to reduce the chances of this happening to other people. And that's pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. So I, I, I don't want to circle back to this because I have a few questions, but before we come back to the questions I have about this, I want to ask what has been some of the most convincing evidence that you've either come across your, or, or, you know, from experiments you've conducted yourself that indicated the unreliable nature of memory. I know that you've described memory with three words, suggestive, subjective, and malleable. And so I'm wondering what has, what types of experiments have you done that made you understand that? In my own experiments, um, we, We've shown people simulated uh, crimes or simulated accidents. It might be a film of a, a crime or an accident. And afterwards, we, we will deliberately try to contaminate somebody's memory. So they see a car go through a yield sign before the accident, and we suggest to them, <clears throat> excuse me, that it was a stop sign. Or they see a perpetrator steal a wallet. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we he's got a green jacket. We suggest it's brown. Mm. Excuse me. I've been doing a lot of talks today. No problem. <laughs> and, and I have <clears throat> since learned that when people are talking on Zoom, they talk about 15% louder. <laughs> <laughs> it creates stress. And that's what's happening, right? You know, it's on the vocal system. But are you telling me? Are you telling me to quiet down? <laughs> no, not you. I'm t I'm talking about myself. So, um, so um, you know that's what we see in these experiments that people give the wrong answer, particularly if they've gotten suggestive information. They go to a lineup or a, a photo spread and they pick the wrong person, especially if they've gotten some suggestive information. So we've documented uh, these kinds of mistakes that people may make in these experimental studies that try to simulate what happens out there in the real world. But um, the people in this field, the, you know, the memory scientists who study eyewitness testimony, they don't just use the uh, experimental lab studies to support the malleable nature of memory. There are all kinds of archival studies of uh, you know, what happens when real eyewitnesses go to a police lineup? How often do they pick a filler in the lineup? Somebody who's not the police suspect, somebody who's just a random, like, distractor. Mm. That happens surprisingly often. It might happen, you know, 20 to 25 percent of the time. So you actually see mistaken identifications in actual cases mm. because those fillers in the lineup are, you know, really random, innocent people. Mm. 